So it is now time for a discussion of some of the hot topics in the treatment of advanced prostate cancer debated at the EAU Virtual Meeting 2020. So I'll give the floor to Professor Gillespie. Thank you very much, John Luca. So there were many highlights um, for the medical treatment of advanced prostate cancer. Since I don't have that much time, I just picked some. Here are my disclosures. And I will talk about the metastatic hormone sensitive state with a focus on, on GnRH antagonists, um, then about the MCRO CRPC state, and also PSMA again, some radioligand therapy in metastatic CRPC. So I start with that very interesting abstract 576 from Dr. Modonuti from Italy. So he showed less cardiovascular events when using a GnRH antagonist versus a GnRH agonist. And he did that by comparison of the reporting of cardiac events in patients treated with agonists versus antagonists using a disproportionality analysis based on a big database um, that is called VGBase. And you see here that if you look for any cardiac events, agonists had a higher reporting of cardiac events than the antagonists. And that's fits very well and confirms also the data from ASCO 2020 that were reported by Neil Shaw um, from the HERO study that was a phase three. And this phase three was testing relugolix. This is a new oral form of a GnRH antagonist versus our well-known luprolite. Obviously, secondary, the primary endpoint was efficacy, so Redugulus was non-inferior to Loiprolite, but, and we, we just discussed in this one, there was a 54% reduction in risk of major cardiovascular events when using the antagonists. You see that here in our range. So I think that was very interesting data. And that leads me to my first question. As you know, there is also a phase three trial running um, using the Garalix. It's called the Pronounce that has as a primary endpoint the cardiovascular safety. So now question for my friends here on the web. In which patients would you nowadays start ADT with a GnRH antagonist? And let's, let's say it's approved and it's also reimbursed. Would you use that in all your patients, in none of your patients, or only in selected patients? And I give that question to the floor. Yeah, I will start with uh, Professor Van Poppel. Uh, what do you do in your practice, in your center? For me, it's very easy. I start with an antagonist in all my patients that deserve ADT these days. So I have no patients going on agonists any longer uh, and then subsequently I will see whether they can stand it well. There's not too much in, uh, uh, allergic reactions at the injection side. Whether it's not too difficult to have it repeated monthly, etc. but the antagonist is now the rule for me. Okay, thanks Dr. Toussaint. Uh, in my practice, I with antagonists and antagonists for all patients, but uh, given the results of that trial, I think I will use antagonists uh, mainly in patients having a severe cardiovascular disease. Uh, men having uh, one prior event, one uh, stroke or, or any strong uh, severe cardiovascular event in that select patients, I think uh, we should go for GnRH antagonist. The other uh, advantage of antagonist, I think, is the uh, lowering uh, of the testosterone level and, level. and we have a fast decrease in testosterone. So in my practice, I use antagonist in patients with a metastatic bulky disease uh, when I want to, to have a, a really fast uh, castration. 
And of course, we need to, to wait for the phase three trial of Pronos because in the HERO trial, the cardiovascular safety was not the primary endpoint. Uh, we have data from a US phase two trial showing also an advantage in terms of cardiovascular safety for antagonists, but the endpoint was not a clinical endpoint. So uh, I think we need really to, to wait for the Pronos trial. Yeah, one comment about the ERO is that the oral antagonist probably raises some issues about the compliance of uh, this patient compared to a systemic administration of uh, ADT, but I mean, that's a, a matter for another comparative trial. So uh, Silke, over to you for the next. Uh... Yes, let's go to the next topic. That's m 0 You know, there were three big phase three um, trials with androgen receptor targeted treatment that where the primary endpoint was metastasis free survival called Spartan, Prosper and Aramis and we now call them short SPA. Um, so you see and that's important these were all three trials um, had included only patients with a PSA doubling time lower than 10 months a baseline PSA of two or more. And I think this is really important to see. So that was the high risk patients of that population. And this led to already a recommendation from the EAU guidelines to offer upalutamide, darolutamide or enzalutamide in addition to ADT to these patients with that high risk of developing metastasis. And now very new, actually very fresh um, from ASCO, we saw that also the secondary endpoint overall survival was positive in all three trials. And at EAU, there was a really good debate ongoing um, from Alicia Morgans uh, versus Giorgio Gondalia. I think, oh no, so Georgia Gondalia was the one who presented the, the patient, sorry, and Jens Betke um, was doing the contra. So you should really listen to it. It was a very good debate. Um, and we also know, as already Guillaume has told, that there is also here in that setting, in the MC or CRPC, um, a lot of changes with the novel imaging in the sense that most of these patients are not M0 any longer if you do a PSMA PET CT. So for this topic, um, I just, out of interest, um, how many patients M0 CRPC do you really see in your clinic? Um, are you recommending this novel imaging, for example, with PSMA PET CT in this patient group? Um, and are you treating these patients with the androgen receptor pathway inhibitors. So I will start this time with uh, Guyan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Silke. Uh, that's a good question. I think the situation is quite unfrequent in, mm -hmm. in clinical practice because we, we are not used to treat uh, localized prostate cancer patients with long-term ADT. So it's only for old patients having a symptomatic disease so I think it's quite unfrequent. The other situation I think is patient with a high risk localized prostate cancer uh, who uh, are treated by radiotherapy plus long-term IDT and there is a progression of PSA uh, before the end of the two or three year ADT. So in that setting we have a really uh, uh, M0 CRPC patients. So to, to answer the question on uh, novel imaging, I think I was used to ask for a new generation imaging two years later because we, we don't have any treatment for that patient and we have to wait for the metastasis. So uh, two years before, yes, uh, I, I asked for a PET, uh, a PET CT, but now because we have free life prolonging drugs in that mm -hmm. setting, there's no uh, need, I think, to, uh, to find the metastasis. And there is also, I think, a risk of uh, under treatment if you find metastasis because maybe you will go for metastasis directed therapy and there's absolute no, mm -hmm. absolutely no proof of uh, improved survival if you do that. So I think it's better to treat the patients with these drugs because there is an action on uh, the metastasis and the free and the overall survival. And Professor Van Poppel, 
What is your take on this? Are you uh, offering uh, uh, next generation imaging to this patient? Are you performing PET PSMA? Uh, we may be overused it. I must say we have easy availability <laughs> for CT. So we have no complex in asking in these patients uh, PSMA for CT. Uh, why is that? Because uh, I fully agree with Guillaume that we have no proof in the survival benefit of metastasis directed therapy, but you know that in my place in Leuven, we are very much inclined to uh, further register and prospectively uh, keep the data of those patients that get metastasis directed therapy. Uh, if a survival benefit, but you can postpone the next step, the next sequence in the treatment, I think there is likely to be a gain for the patient maybe only in quality of life and maybe in quantity of life. Uh, we decide on the treatment uh, with these drugs in the uh, category of patients in the multidisciplinary team discussion. I, we just had the one yesterday and we had one patient and I must say that probably it's once in a while, maybe 10, 15 patients a year and no more. So it's, a, it's not a deal but we do not have good rules on what to do and we are inclined to go for metastasis directed therapy so imaging would be there in any case of this yes i think it is also a good reason uh, to perform a correct follow-up because i mean many of these patients live longer so you have to compare the metastatic landscape before and after treatment so one probably good reason to go for imaging uh, is this one. Okay, I agree with you, yeah. you Gianluca. So the next one is about radio ligand therapy, also a very hot topic in uh, in the moment for MCRPC. And um, you probably have seen, also this one was from ASCO 2020, uh, a prospective phase two, uh, that has to be um, said, um, the therapy, trial and there was a whole thematic session um, at EAU20 about that topic, the thematic session four, so it's really worth looking at it. So it all is a bit about this um, therapy trial um, that tested lutetium PSMA treatment versus capacitaxel in 200 men. And the primary endpoint uh, was PSA response. I mean, you can discuss about that endpoint, but it was a phase three. And you see here on the right that the deuterium PSMA led to more PSA um, responses than the cabocytaxel. So that's a chemotherapy. Um, and we are all really waiting um, for the phase three trial. Um, that's called Vision. Um, it's led by Michael Morris from the Memorial Stone Kettering, and um, we hope really that we see this data very soon, maybe even this year. And here's my questions to the other experts. Uh, are you referring patients for treatment with radio ligands? Um, obviously outside of clinical trials, are you using it already? Um, if yes, in which line? And you have probably seen that uh, Michael Hoffman in his trial, in the therapy trial that I just showed you, um, was using for inclusion not only a PSMA PET-CT but also a FDG PET-CT. So are you doing that in clinical practice? To you. So, the, Professor Van Poppel, what is your experience uh, with the radionuclide treatment? Our experience in our university hospital in Leuven is very uh, spare simply because we do not have the agent available and we cannot administer it uh, by ourselves for the time being. So we discuss whether a patient is a candidate and when he's a candidate we have to refer them to Germany outside Belgium. Yeah, yeah. And so, so my question to you, just out of interest, um, is that covered by the insurance or is, does the patient have, have to pay for himself? Most of the time the patient will have to pay for himself, but we try to help them to get reimbursed by health insurance instances. It's not granted. So I, I think uh, these patients typically are referred to radioligand therapy late in the course of disease. So probably when they 
and they exhausted all the lines of therapy. So, uh, Guillaume, what is your take on this? Do you think we should move this uh, treatment option earlier in the course of disease? Do we have enough data to start doing this? Um, I think it, it's a bit early to, to start with this uh, therapy at an early stage. Uh, I don't have any experience of that therapy because in France we, we have only one clinical trial ongoing so we can start with the recruitment but uh, it's only at uh, the same stage, a later stage after uh, two lines of therapies. But maybe it's interesting to, to go to move earlier, but I think it will be uh, the next steps as we did with abiraterone and zolutamide, apalutamide. If it works at a late stage, maybe it works at an early stage, but uh, of course we have to prove it with, uh, with clinical trials. Okay, so thank you very much for this interesting discussion on hot topics in advanced prostate cancer. So the therapeutic armamentarium has expanded clearly and imaging will play a major role in the future. And our task will be to implement the precision medicine also in this field with the aid of genomics by tailoring the right treatment to the right patient at the right time in the course of the disease. So thank you again to all the experts.